What is your background? I'm not such a bad student. Um, we would sleep under our desks, but also, you know, people glorify what happened in the past. You know, one of the Web3 games need to be games that have never existed before. And one yeah. of the unique challenges for our team is like working cross time zone, cross culturally. We pretty quietly have like basically, I would say probably the largest team in Web3 gaming. So we're going to be king of the gaming chains. It's like work-life balance, like no, like that's, you know, that's maybe for other people um, or another time in our life. <laughs> it's super fun because, you know, I was a bit overthinking about this format. I was like, should I do a podcast? Should I do an interview? And I saw your tweet uh, on Twitter and you said you were at home for two months and you had free time to do interviews and content with people. And I was like, yeah, fuck it. This is my time and this is my sign to do it. Uh, I'm super curious. Why are you stuck at home for two months? Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, like I, so I, I really wanted to take a break from traveling. Um, you know, I, and uh, it also like fit well. Uh, so I had made some commitments Uh, and I really liked it, right? Like I loved going to Argentina you know, and then I also had a couple of friends getting married. So I was traveling and uh, it's great also to be in the field with the community, you know, very face to face. But I also think that, you know, during a bear market, during it's a time to build. It's a time to be at home. Uh, it's not a time to be like too active traveling around. Um, and when I think back to, you know, what got us to the last Uh, bull market. I mean, you know, it was during COVID, right? So yeah. everyone was at home working and everyone was super productive. Um, so I think there's something to that where it's like being forced to stay home increases your output. <laughs> so I'm trying it out. And so far, I love that. I feel like so uh, on top of things. Um, it's really, really hard to juggle, uh, you know, being out, uh, meeting people, having different meals, uh, having meetups, And then also having the energy and the time to, you know, manage the team, you know, uh, be present with the community. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a lot to balance. So yeah, you know, I, I prefer to, I, I prefer to be at home, living a healthy life, going to the gym every day, uh, eating well. Uh, so yeah, that's my preference, right? But you know, obviously, yes, I have to be out, out in the, out in the wild uh, from time to time as well. Yeah, you feel like it's easier to focus and achieve work when you are at home instead of uh, outside and meeting people. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, let's let's talk a bit about uh, your background. Um, what kind of uh, student were you, for example? What is your <laughs> background? I'm not such a bad student. Um, so the interesting thing is I went to, uh, yeah, I, I did pretty well in school, but I was such a bad student. Um, how is that possible? So, uh, yeah, my mom is Korean, right? So I had a, uh, I had a tiger mom. And so she always made me like, you know, study or try to, you know, be the best in whatever I did academically. And so I was a good student when I really cared uh, about the thing that I was learning about. So, you know, I actually really love biology. Why? Because I grew up collecting insects and fossils, right? Like I'm kind of like the person who grew up loving dinosaurs and actually going out and trying to find dinosaur bones and then, you know, studying it um, and continuing to study it. Uh, so yeah, I really love science. So biology, I was actually a, nas a national semifinalist in the biology Olympiad. Oh. Uh, so I'm like a I was like a competitive biologist or something as a <laughs> as a uh, high school student. And yeah, I went to boarding school actually. So uh, I was so into World of Warcraft. Um, you know, I played World of Warcraft at launch. I actually played the beta. I was a beta tester um, and I played at launch. And, you know, I was around 12 years old at the time, I would say. Um, and I played so much that my mom made me go to boarding school. She, she wanted me to... And she wanted me to go leave home because yeah. I was playing video games all the time. And she sent me to a boarding school where they turn off the internet at 9 p.m. Oh, my it's God. It's actually the same, it's the same uh, boarding school that Zuckerberg or Mark Zuckerberg went to. And when he was a student, he actually, like, rerouted the internet from the faculties or the teachers' rooms into his room or something like that. So that's kind of like a legend within our school. Did, did you do the they same? Turned off <laughs> So we got we had ways of getting it around it. So at that time they were inventing like you know the prepaid internet cards that you could uh, use. Uh, so some people were using that. And that's what I used to raid and wow. But really what we did was we mainly.
play Dota. <laughs> so we would play Dota LAN parties okay. uh, in the dorm. Um, anyway, so you can see that for some reason when I'm when you're asking this question about me as a student, gaming is you know coming up because my relationships with games you know, was kind of antagonistic to my relationship with school, right? <laughs> uh, they're kind of like uh, coming into conflict. Anyway, so I went to boarding school uh, and, and, you know, I played a lot of Dota and World of Warcraft when I was there for high school. And then, yeah, when I went to university, um, I, I went to Yale University um, and I didn't have as much time to study <laughs> and I didn't have as much time to play games because I was socializing more. I was actually a uh, president of my fraternity. So I was kind of like living a more of a fraternity life uh, in college, to be honest. Um, and that's also like, you know, that's where I, I think learned the power of community, right? Because a fraternity, it's kind of like a community. You have to manage, there's drama, there's expectations. Yeah. Uh, you have to throw events. Um, you have to make it fun for people. You have to gamify attendance, you know, anyways. Uh, so I, feel like a life, a I feel like the life in a fraternity is more like the life in a company than school itself you know you, you learn so much uh, in it yeah I, I all the, a lot of the things that i learned about you know uh you know we're uh, working i definitely learned more from uh yeah definitely learned more from uh, my, fra my fraternity life also some like marketing uh ideas right like oh how do we make our party bigger than any party that's ever happened uh you know either at our fraternity or in our school you know when we would you know do a growth experiments right like we i remember we used to all we used to whenever we wanted to like really have a huge party we would scrape you know we would uh take all the emails from the school's website <laughs> so like that 10,000 emails and then we would just send out a mass email right so then <laughs> later on that you know uh uh, I think taught me the, the power of email marketing, right? So actually one of the interesting things that sets Axie apart and Ronin apart. So we actually use a lot of email marketing and Substack. We have over 400,000 uh, subscribers to our uh, Substack accounts, right? So and some stuff like that is really powerful. Yeah, that's amazing. And then after university, did you work to a classic Web2 company or not at all? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so I graduated and so when I was in college, I started a hedge fund, um, a small, it was like a small fund, okay. uh, with my friends and we wanted to invest, uh, but we didn't have enough money. Um, so, you know, the, I did that, but then I was also, uh, working, uh, doing like talent, uh, uh recruiting, I guess, for different hedge funds. Uh, so like, basically how can you. That, what was I doing there was like trying to figure out how do you tell if someone is super, super smart and going to be a great trader <laughs> or a great uh, quantitative an uh, analyst. And then that was one of the things that was like, okay, taught me how to uh, figure out who's really smart and, and who's going to who's gonna be able to do well. Uh, so I was doing talent uh, recruitment. And then, yeah, like, we had some idea of how to turn that business into a startup. Um, we did that a little bit, but uh yeah it was actually really interesting like we we created some resume formatting uh uh products um because one of the things that we noticed as recruiters was that whenever we got someone's resume we had to reformat it <laughs> um but like actually we went to yale and at our school they would just give everyone the standard format the template like the correct template um and everyone would just use that so we're like okay like why it's kind of elitist that ivy league students um we get this template that is correct whereas everyone else has to figure out how to format it themselves so we we're like okay we can just turn this into a product and and to release it to the world actually it's still a needed product um but yeah uh and i worked on that but i didn't i wasn't passionate about it like finding i have other people find their uh dream jobs that was not really what i was interested in um I was also doing some campaign work <laughs> for some reason. So I was also like helping out with political campaigns. Um, and I think that that's also you know, obviously what taught me a lot about, uh, you know, Web3 got me ready to start different movements and get people to like, you know, buy into something uh, and get excited about it. So, uh, yeah. And then, you know, so that, that was like 2016, 2017. And then at the end of 2017, I discovered CryptoKitties. Okay. And then, if I'm right, you became a community member in Axie Infinity and in Axie Community, and you helped them, first of all, as a community member. And then, with time, you became more inv involved and you became part of the team, right? 
Yeah, so I started as a community member. We kind of, you know, took things step by step. So I think one of the first things that I did was to help edit uh, and roll out, you know, help edit and launch the white paper, uh, the initial and original white paper uh, for Axie Infinity. Um, and then, yeah, you know, I would I was also helping to onboard people, referring people from the CryptoKitties community. And, you know, we took things step by step. And, uh, you know, and it, pretty quickly, though, it seemed like, uh, you know, it was working. And I think I was a I was a good fit for the team. And I've actually moved to Vietnam. Uh, so I think I joined in maybe late March of 2018. And then I think by May or June, I had moved to Vietnam. Uh, so I like I <laughs> gave up my entire life in the States. I was living in New York City at the time. I gave my dog to my parents. I moved. And you moved um, alone yeah. to Vietnam. Yeah, I moved all by oh, myself to Vietnam. Amazing. <laughs> okay. And and then I think it's a great example because I, I have a bit of a similar story. Um, I started as, as a community member at G5 Months, for example, and then I became a moderator. And now I'm part of the team as a marketing manager and I also handle partnerships. You know, a lot of people ask how they can find a job in the Web3 market. But mm. I think both of us, we have a good example of you can just be more involved in the community itself and then find mm. a job in in this um, project and community it's hard let's let's be honest it's harder now um maybe than it was back then uh but like usually what i say is like just do the thing that you want to do <laughs> yeah right like especially as a you know community or content creator start managing the community um start making or start writing blog posts start making articles right um come up with uh, different experiments uh, find sponsors, you know, ask the team for a marketing budget. Hey, I have this idea for a campaign I want to run. Can you guys sponsor some tokens or NFTs? I would like to do it, right? It's a lot of what, like, you know, you just run the experiments that you would if you were on the team. And if the team is smart and really likes what you're doing, then uh, they will, they will, they, they may add you. Of course, they're also, you know, working full time is very hard. And it's actually maybe not for a lot of people in Web3 having a real having a quote-unquote real job yeah. um it's actually not amazing <laughs> for a lot of people you have less freedom uh and actually a lot of people in web3 they want freedom uh so there are also ways to contribute as a community member right like you know that's one of the amazing things about web3 is you build up a position and then you're incentivized to help that position succeed that's actually how most political campaigns work as well um political campaigns have a very small number of paid positions um, a lot of people and, you know, who work or volunteer for the campaign, you know, they have some, uh, you know, they, they will volunteer and then, you know, maybe they can get a job later. You know, for me, I, what I would do is I would actually bet on the political campaigns. I would gamble on them or buy as much of, you know, I, first, obviously I had to have conviction in the campaign thinking that they would win and I would build up a position and then, uh, I would help the campaign win, um, uh, so, so that's kind of like, it's kind of similar yeah, to it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And um, to circle back to you joining the team, um, what, how many people were you in the team back then? Yeah, was, I think like five or six, very small. We were living in a, we were in Vietnam. We were in a studio apartment. We would take off our shoes when we entered. Uh, we would sleep under our desks. Wow. At the, uh, sometimes, literally, people would sleep under the desks. Um, <laughs> that was something that I remember. Uh, what else? Yeah, it was a studio apartment, maybe like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten desks uh, in the entire uh, place. Um, yeah, it was a magical. It was a magical zone. But also, you know, people glorify what happened in the past. The reality is, we were very nervous that we might go broke. Mm -hmm. Uh, crypto prices were crashing. Um, so when we, we raised 600 ETH originally for the through the Axie origin sale, it was actually one of the first mints, I think the first reveal, um, to be honest. Um, so we, you know, we invented a lot of different uh, structures that we now see uh, today. The first animated NFT, I believe, or the first an animated PFP, you know, pet. And, uh, you know, we raised 600 ETH. And then we thought, okay, that's great because ETH was eight hundred dollars at the time. But then, you know, within nine months, straight down. Uh, we and then, uh, you know, we didn't uh, we didn't sell or you know we didn't convert it. There were stable coins weren't even really a thing back then. Um, I would say so. Uh, yeah, we you know, and then it was like we only had twenty thousand dollars left. So 
uh, you know, people, it was the golden age, I would say in some ways, but you know, it was also very scary. We didn't know uh, that we would succeed. And, you know, we were all always running out of money. We knew that we were the best team in the space and we knew that we had the best community, but there were times where we thought, Hey, maybe that might be not be enough. What if you're the best in an industry that never takes off? Uh, what if, you know, yeah, you just run out of money, right? So yeah, there were times where we didn't pay ourselves. <laughs> that's an amazing uh, transition for me. Um, you were five, you were running out of, mo out of money. So how did you face uh, this challenge? Um, how did you overcome it? And how did you find ways to bounce back? Do you remember? Do you remember how, how it was and how you did it? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was whenever you were facing some kind of crisis that might paralyze you, you just have to take it step by step, right? Think about a game of chess, right? Like you're making the, there's a correct move that you can make at any moment to move forward. Um, and also, of course, you know, being in uh, emerging markets, being in an emerging market, uh, you know, and paying ourselves very little, to be honest, like that's part of our strength, right? Is that we're very resilient. We're not paying ourselves like these huge Silicon Valley uh, type uh, salaries. Um, and that's always been part of our DNA. Um, so yeah, I, I would say like, you know, leaning on the community, um, you know, talking to the community, figuring out what they wanted. Uh, you know, some of our community members were really interested in uh, land and saying, hey, like, you know, we we had this concept for terrariums, which was like, okay, axes are pets. They should have a terrarium where you can like fade them, pet them. And people were saying, hey, like, this is kind of similar to land. Uh, you know, I want to buy land <laughs> in Axi. So can you guys make it and sell it to us? Uh, so we're like, okay, like, that sounds really interesting. Um, and so we made, we, we had a land sale and, you know, we were able to raise ETH and, uh, you know, keep going from there. Okay. So... I would say that you listen to your community and thanks to your community, you found ways to raise money again and keep going, right? Um, another question I have for you now is, um, you were five um, in, in your team and what kind of uh, skills or what did you look for uh, in your early stage employees? You know, the ones that you started to hire to go to 10 members or 15 members in your team. Was it hard to find the the best fits for your team or was it kind of easy? It's always, uh, it's always hard to find the right people. Um, and I would say, you know, one of the unique challenges for our team is like working cross time zone, cross culturally. And um, so that's always something that we have to be cognizant of. Um, you know, but I think like, yeah, you know, obviously we have an amazing community behind us, right? And, you know, we see them as, you know, really parts or extensions of the team. Um, and, you know, when you think about like community management, what is management? Management is when you're responsible for the output of someone else, uh, right? So that's also another way to think about it, right? Is like, you know, that for me as the community manager in the early days, right? I will always say like, yeah, I'm responsible for helping to make sure that the output uh, of the community is as large and as positive as possible. Okay, I see. And, and now today, how many are you in the team? Do you know? Do you have a rough number, maybe? How many employees do you have at at Sky Mavis? Yeah, it's like two hundred and fifty, something that's, like that. That's crazy. If you <laughs> we're a, you're a sleeping giant, you know, like people. You, I don't even want to, you know, I don't care or even want people to know that we have uh, this amount of uh, power behind us. Um, <laughs> yeah. because. Uh, but yeah, yeah, but yeah, we, we, you know, we, 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 we pretty quietly have like, basically, I would say probably the largest team in web three gaming. Yeah. This is a big machine. I, I figured out because I was doing some research and I saw it on your, on your website. And would you say that today the management, uh, is really different because if you look back at the time where you were only five people in the team and now you have more than 200 people. Um, mm. is it super different? Do you find it more difficult or is it just different and you just get used to it? It's, I mean, it's really, you go through get growing pains, right? Just like as a human, you have your awkward adolescent phase or puberty, right? Like companies have that too. Um, where, you know, before you can use your new, your size effectively, you're going to use your size actually against you, <laughs> to be honest, like it's gonna, it's gonna actually cause a lot of things to break down. Uh, but it's a needed process so that you can grow your long-term output. 
Um, so that's one of the things that we've gone through, right? Was that, you know, and that also coincided our growth phase, you know, getting accustomed to our uh, new bodies and team size, right? That also happened during a really rough period, right? 2022, where the market was down only even now, right? So, um, yeah, and, you know, the, the very few members of our current company were around actually when things were going super well for, uh, for, for crypto and Web3 gaming, right? So uh, that also keeps them hungry, I think, too, for, you know, they want to be a part of the, the, the story moving forward. Yeah, they want to be part of the success and and live that time of that period of time where everything is kind of working and you feel like you are super powerful, I guess. Um, so you said you mentioned the state of the market today. Uh, we both know that it's super complicated for a lot of games and web through gaming projects. Uh, do you feel like you had to uh, kind of change your initial vision and adapt yourself to the market and the changes we had in, in web through gaming since you started at sky Mavis. you always have to change and experiment and constantly reinvent yourself so like to even change is to say that i am something which we're not we're not necessarily right like attached to any one idea or concept about who we are um you know i think the generally you know we knew that hey we need to introduce blockchain technology to people through something that's relatable uh and that was that's always been you know the a, a key key theme uh, you know, our Sky Mavis, uh, our official mission is to uh, uh, bring economic freedom to everyone, um, starting with gamers. So, right, it's like it's, it, that's always been part of it. But how we get there, uh, you know, I think I think we're very uh, flexible, and we we really like to experiment. Um, so, yeah, you know, we have to we have to reinvent ourselves, and we have to be, uh, you know, always on the lookout for new inventions that could benefit us. You know, what was one of the, you know, wh what created our traction actually was a big part of it was that we were looking at DeFi, uh, right? And it was like, how do you combine different aspects of the crypto stack and uh, and add it to gaming uh, in a way that creates a game that could never have existed before, right? Web3 games need to be games that have never existed before uh, or have been possible to exist before. They actually cannot just be like in an, uh, EVE online on the blockchain or RuneScape on the blockchain. Uh, there has, you have to think about like ways, you know, obviously the peer to peer or the player economy or the player market can be 10 X better and, and, uh, trustless, but there also have to be novel innovations. Um, so that's one of the things, right. Is like, what is a zero to one thing that gives us an unfair advantage? And to be honest, like. That's also the only way to win. Um, and actually, that's actually the way to like find a shortcut to win. Uh, you know, like making an amazing game like takes so long and so much money that, you know, that's obviously making an amazing game is important, um, but you need to have some special sauce. Uh, you need to have something, some magic uh, added into the mixture, uh, you know, to guarantee uh, success, right? Yeah, I agree. I think you can't just take a game that is existing in Web2 already and just add NFTs on top of it and, and pretend that you made something that is going to work in Web3, I agree about this. Um, it's super fun because uh, earlier you mentioned that everyone was kind of chasing um, the Web3 full-time jobs and was mm. thinking that you had some freedom wh when you were mm. uh, working full-time Web3. And you, I felt like you were saying that it's not really true. You've I feel like you are working a lot in a week, for example, and people um, often think that when you work uh, in Web3, you are you have more time than when you are full-time Web2. Um, I had a job in Web2, for example, myself, and you know, when you work in Web2, you have your job from Monday to Friday, and, and that's it, you know, you work from nine to maybe six, and at the end of the, your, your work day. In Web3, it's so different. I feel like you work every day, you don't have weekends, you don't have, um, set times to work. Sometimes you have to wake up at night to take a call with someone that is in the other side of the world and so on. Um, how does a week look like uh, in your life as a founder, for example? Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a servant. Um, I'm just a humble servant uh, to the community and to Sky Mavis, right? To my team at Sky Mavis, um, right? <laughs> there's there, there are so many uh, uh, balls in the air, constant launches, you know, constant announcements. Um, also, you know, helping to give our insight on what can make our products better and, and 
uh, things that will, uh, you know, that are going to be better received by uh, users. Um, of course, then, um, you know, the, the community, right? So making sure that they feel heard and that there's not some kind of a, a huge wall uh, between SkyMavis and the community. Um, so you're, you're asking about like what, uh, what a typical week looks like. It depends, you know, so I, I do have a lot of meetings, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with people on my team. Um, I also have, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of announcements and articles and posts to review and edit and make sure that everything is going out well. And I mean, there's just so much right? like, you know, board meetings, meetings with the founders, syncing up with different teams. Um, yeah, you know, being present with the community, like, you know, talking to them on where on different channels, whether that's Twitter, Discord, you know, having calls with them one on one. Um, I'm in DMs with so many of our prominent community members um, and active community members as well. Um, so yeah, like, you know, and it also obviously depends on if I'm traveling, um, but yeah, you know, I also like for me, I try to lead by example, right? So what do I want the community to be doing? Those are the things that I try to do, uh, right? It's like, you know, play the games, get feedback on the games, make content about the games. Um, you know, obviously we want them to even be building tools for the games. Um, I support those tools. I, I'm not like an engineer, so I cannot uh, develop them. Um, we even building games, um, right? So I'm trying out the new uh, games as well and giving feedback on them. Um, so yeah, they, you know, there's a lot, right? And then obviously also there are many games that want to build on Ronin and because, you know, I'm very front facing, they'll reach out to me, right? Then it's like, okay, looking at those, uh, sending them over to the proper people. Um, so those, yeah, th that's an assortment of the things that I do, I guess, uh, in, in a week. Um, in terms of my schedule, yeah, you know, I try to be consistent. Um, I try to wake up around, you know, like not too intense, like 7.30 or 8 a.m. And uh, I'm not like, you know, I've gone through periods where I became one of those schedule optimizers, right? <laughs> where it's like, oh, try to wake up at 5 a.m., go to the gym, like do meditation, do yoga, <laughs> uh, eat breakfast. To be honest, though, like if you do, if you need to do all of that stuff to start getting ready for work, you're not going to be able to do it you're not gonna be able to work without doing all of those different things, right? So there's also a thing about like over-optimizing. So for me, I just try to wake up at a reasonable time, you know, uh, have my morning routine, which is usually getting coffee, try to go outside, get some sunlight, go to the gym, uh, you know, but I'm not super strict on, you know, I need to do that before I start working, right? Uh, sometimes, right, like you wanna use your energy from when you first wake wake up, you don't want to use that on going to the gym and doing all these different things. <laughs> you want to just use it on like attacking the day and doing the most difficult uh, piece of work, right? Yeah, definitely. That's super interesting because I was also in in that phase, uh, like maybe three months ago, where I was trying every every morning <laughs> routines and so on, you know. And I was like, nah, it's. I feel like it's a full time job as well, you know. You have to spend three or four hours. To meditate, <laughs> to work out, to drink, to no, nah, nah, I can't, I can't do it. Honestly, I can't do it. So, I'm a bit like you. I just wake up and I try to uh, at least go to the gym. Um, I, w I want to to come back to something that is really interesting. You said uh, you feel like people are going to you because you seem like the face of running on socials, and I want to say that it's amazing the amount of uh, activity you have on Twitter as a founder. In my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I feel like today you are one of the most active founders on Twitter. Um, you retweet everything. When when a user is posting a content, you always retweet, comment, like. Uh, you even uh, share stuff on Ronin pages, on Axie pages, and so on. So yeah, um, I know that this takes a lot of time as well. And and when I saw that, I was like, how many hours does uh, Geo put in a week? Like it's it should be amazing the amount of hours you put. I don't know if you ever try to estimate the number of hours you put uh, to work in a week i think it's uh, it's crazy um, honestly yeah i would estimate it's like 100 you know 100 hours or something like that per week um i'm i mean what else it's more more interesting is like what am i doing that's not working uh in a week right it's like i'm going to the gym um, i'm spending some time with my wife uh <laughs> yeah like that's mainly it like and that's what i prefer right i actually like that like more of a simple uh clean schedule where, you know, I, and I'm playing games, I guess, but usually I, I'm actually like playing Axie games mostly. Like I should play more non-Axie games or non-Ronin games, to be honest. 
I actually haven't. I I bought Diablo Four. I actually only played during the uh, the beta test or something like that during March. Uh, I bought like the most expensive fucking uh, copy or something, and then I got flooded out of trying it after they nerfed the where the pulverized bear or something like that, right? Because I actually had my build all planned out. I was playing in my head. I was playing Diablo in my head, um, and I was really fun. Uh, but then uh, they nerfed the build that I wanted to try. <laughs> then I was like, fuck, I'm not, I'm not going to play. So I still haven't uh, gotten around to playing. You I, I like, haven't tried You were like, no, I don't want to play with you anymore. Fuck it. I don't want to play <laughs> Diablo anymore. Okay, I see. I see. It's, it's super fun because you mentioned that uh, you're trying to find some, uh, some balance between life and work. Uh, because you you said you were married, uh, is it sometimes hard to to you know um, spend time with your family and and not overthink about work? Do not have your phone when you are outside and so on. You know. <clears throat> yeah, I don't think like I try. There is no you know. While we were talking about this, the founders we were talking about this recently. It's like work life balance. Like no, like that's you know that's maybe for other people um, or another time in our life. <laughs> Um, right now there's too much, uh, there's too much opportunity. There's too much uh, stuff to be done. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's one of the things that I try to do is like to be present with my wife when, you know, she's talking to me, <laughs> respond <laughs> to look at my wife and re listen to her when she's speaking and to ask her questions, take care of my health. Um, that's my, maybe that's for now. That's my like definition of work-life balance. <laughs> okay. That's interesting. I think that I see that we have, we all have the same problems. So it's funny. Um, I, I want to, to add that uh, last week I was uh, watching an interview from uh, Mr. Beast and he tried to uh, make his life easier, I would say. Um, and he resumed his life around three main points. Uh, and the points are one, working out every day. Uh, second, his YouTube and the content creature creation on his channel. And third, mm -hmm. his brand, uh, Fistable, Fistable, the chocolate brand. Uh, what would be your three main points? Like the three points where you are trying to focus your life on? Mm. I would say, yeah, like, you know, I would say my marriage, uh, one. <laughs> my, yeah. So my marriage, uh, if I have focus, if I'm like focusing on my marriage enough, then everything else will work out. And that's kind of that's kind of one of my uh, principles. So my marriage, yeah, like Ronan and Axi, uh, you know, my work at Sky Mavis, and and then my health, yeah, uh, you know, so like making sure that I'm exercising and eating uh, relatively well. So I think those those are my three. Yeah, working out as well because you mentioned it. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, let's talk a bit about um, the future of Sky Mavis. Like, where do you see Sky Mavis in, for example? I, I won't ask for five years because in this market, it doesn't make sense. I feel like it's in way too long. Um, I feel like, you know, I don't know if you have the same feeling, but in this market, I feel like three months is like one year in, in, in a Web2 market, for example, in a classic market. Um, so I'm going to ask you in two years, where do you see Sky Mavis and Axe Infinity? Yeah, sure. Well, I think what is the unique thing? The unique thing is that we have this amazing community. We actually have products that are being used uh, at scale. Right? So I think there are around 150,000 Ronin gamers right now that are very active on a month base month basis. You know, from my calculations, there are around you know 250,000 uh, Ronin gamers. Uh, sorry, there are around 250,000 blockchain gamers in general, right? So 150, so I would say like around 60% of all blockchain gamers are Ronin and Axie gamers. Uh, so that's, you know, I think like the fact that we actually have traction and we have this community, I think that's our unique selling point. Uh, we can use that unique selling point, like we were seeing with Pixels, to attract the serious builder, builders, right? And it's not about like necessarily, our approach is to be a little bit more curated, curated at the beginning, where we're trying to attract the best teams, the teams that uh, you know resemble us in a way, right? Where they're experimental, they're leaning into Web three uh, uh, experimentation techniques. Um, they're very, they have like the ability to interact with the, and inspire the community, and they also also have like amazing art and uh, you know the ability to make uh, uh, great enough games to let the other aspects uh, shine. 
Um, so yeah, I think our approach is a little bit different, right? And that we're curated uh, and that we actually have uh, a community. Um, and I think we can use that, it's, we can use that strength to uh, continue to compound on this lead that we have of actual real builders and real traction. Um, I think a lot of the other Web3 gaming projects, whether it's intentional or not, right? It's like, you know, their main goal, it seems, is just to make sure that their token has a high valuation and they can kind of obfuscate uh, their true traction through wash trading and things like that. Um, but if you actually know how to like, you know, calculate and, and look at the real data, um, you know, if you actually talk to, to blockchain gamers, um, you can see that there are very actual, <laughs> very few uh, blockchain gamers that aren't running gamers. I think there are a couple of notable exceptions, right? Pixels was one exception, like check, we have them. Uh, Parallel is doing really awesome stuff. Like, would love to have them, to be honest, on Ronin. I think they could be potentially a good fit. Um, is it a, is it an open call to get a Parallel on Ronin? You know, th th it, it's, I think it's definitely worth a discussion. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see. No no promises, obviously. You know, that, and I, I, I'm just kind of, you know, yeah, yeah, being uh, transparent about what, what, I, what I think, uh, who I think is good. Um, so yeah, you know, but but yeah, that, that's that. So I see I see us like really leveraging that position to become you know the premier distributor and launchpad for Web three games, um, and uh, if we can do that, and everyone is using the Ronin wallet, you know, then there's actually a lot of interesting opportunities that open up down the line. What if your gamer identity, you know, could be used as a form of social reputation, even in the real world? Uh, what if you could pay? Uh, for, you know, what if, uh, in the West we have Venmo, um, but in, in, uh, I think like there, there's a, there's a chance for like some sort of a payment app or wallet, uh, that where you're getting like inputs and resources and currencies from your in-game activity to actually like, you know, help impact the real world. Right. And we start, uh, we saw a glimpse of this. We saw the first version of this, right? Uh, last bull market where vendors in the Philippines were accepting Axie tokens, SLP and AXS uh, for goods and services, right? Why? Because it's kind of like marketing, right? It's like, oh, if I'm running a hot dog stand uh, or a food stand, then I know that, you know, there's a lot of Axie players in my neighborhood. If I say, hey, I'm the first food stand to accept your in-game resources in my neighborhood, I can actually, right, like attract a lot of attention from that community, right? So. Um, I think I think there will be a lot more like that in the future. Yeah, sounds really interesting. I didn't know about this one. I didn't know that they were accepting uh, um, Axi and SLP token for payments in real life. That's amazing. Um, in part, in, especially in in those countries, you know, I think it's amazing for them. It's great opportunities. People tend to uh, underestimate uh, the play to earn aspect in that kind of countries, but I think mm -hmm. it's super interesting for them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the p people in the West, right, like they ha need to learn how to, you know, think outside of themselves in their current situations, right? That's also, you know, that that's part of the perspective that I get from traveling, to be honest. So I just went to Argentina. In Argentina, inflation is 100%. <laughs> uh, well, it's like in 100% per year uh, or more. Um, and uh, yeah, when you talk to, you know, when you talk to people there, like all, there's no such thing as conspiracy theories in Argentina, right? Because the people there, they have no trust in the government. The government has failed them. Uh, they have no faith in the fiat system. The fiat system has collapsed. Uh, so they're kind of like living in the future, um, to, in, in my opinion. Uh, so uh, yeah, you know, a lot of these things that we take for granted, you know, in the West, um, in emerging markets, you know, there's no illusion that those things are working. Um, and and that's kind of like I think where a lot of the understanding of uh, Web three and crypto work comes from for these people. Yeah, definitely I agree. Uh, I I wanted to bounce back on a tweet you did. I think it was two days ago. You said you wanted to become the king of the gaming chains, and you added uh, a one piece div. Remember? Do you yeah, think yeah, people yeah. realize that running is becoming a competitor for? Uh, gaming focused chains like, for example, uh, Immutable, Avalanche, Freezer, and so on. And and now with the big announcement today uh, of Pixel uh, integration, I think people will just realize about this. Yeah, I mean they're gonna realize it, you know, eventually. Um, you know, my, my idea with that is, you know, if you say if you say something, it happens, 
Um, if you say, if you repeat something, everything in your body and mind aligns towards that goal, right? Speaking things into existence, right? The power of positive energy. These are all, I think, well-documented phenomena. Uh, so one of the things that I, you know, my wife was telling me about last week was, you know, in the, in the last bull market, I would always tell her when I first met her, I was like, yeah, I'm a founder of the largest <laughs> crypto game, Axie Infinity. And she's like, oh, like how many players do you have? I said 200, 300, right? So even when we had very small uh, number of players, we were always like talking about how we would become the biggest. And I think that actually is part of what caused it to happen, um, right? When you say something, when you repeat something, people start to believe it. Um, and yeah, you know, that's the idea, right? It's like, yeah, we're going to be king of the pirates. We're going to be king of the gaming game, gaming chains. And, uh, you know, I, I really see it, uh, starting to unfold before my eyes. That's amazing. Let's see, let's see if you can, if you can do it, I will follow it closely. Um, last thing, do you have uh, any advices for people that are starting their journey as builders, entrepreneurs, and so on? Mm. Any, any random advices, maybe? You say, you, you, you just gave one. You said, um, it was kind of fake it until you make it. You said, be mm. very vocal about what you want to do and what you want to become. And do you have another one, for example? Yeah, I mean, I think like reading Paul Graham, to be honest, like in Y Combinator, um, I think that's actually really important for Web3 founders because a lot of the... Hmm. So one of the things is people think that building a Web3 game is like building a game. But what if, let's imagine that building a Web3 game was more like building a startup. Kind of makes sense, right? You're using new technology. Um, you're building for a smaller market that might get bigger in the future. To me, it's more akin to working at a startup or building a startup. Um, and when you're, you know, and a lot of gaming founders might not have that kind of experience of building more of a traditional startup. I actually think that that's actually really, uh, in, there's a lot of interesting learnings there. So. Yeah, I would read like the, the Y Combinator and Paul Graham writings, um, you know, even techniques on how to build community. Actually, like, uh, you know, those aren't invented by Web3. Like, you know, there is actually a lot of really good advice on community building from uh, traditional startups. Why? Because traditional startups are used to situations where they only have like 50 to 100 users. And, right. And, and actually, like one, one of the ideas is that you know, very large billion dollar companies can actually come from, you know, uh, MVP products that only have like a hundred users. So. Okay. That sounds good. Thank you for this. Uh, bonus question. Bonus one. Uh, I saw on Twitter, you shared one piece GIFs, vagabond GIFs uh, and pictures. So I, I assume you like animes. Um, what are your top three animes of all time? for you yeah i was i'm uh, to be honest i'm not like uh i'm not like a super otaku or anything like that okay and uh, but yeah you know i i like uh i like original dragon ball uh i like uh i like attack on titan and what else so hunter x hunter is pretty uh sentimental to me because i watched it like in the early days while we were building axie right and it kind of felt like we were right kids growing up and discovering our powers so. It reminds you of the golden time where you were five yeah. in, uh, in the desk. Okay. Well, that's it. 